We're at the Sight Sea Summit in Victoria, British Columbia. It's uh, Saturday, January the 27th, 2018. I'm talking to Heather Tufts. Um, Heather, can you tell us about, from your point of view, the BCUC, the British Columbia Utilities Commission process that took place? Yeah, I'd like to talk about that a little bit because this was the NDP promise that they would not stop Site C but they would make sure that it went before the BC Utilities Commission in order to get uh, a well-informed decision and many of us uh, really hoped and believed that that would be a good process. So I've been involved in the Site C issue for over a decade now and have been very much against it from the very early days of my involvement. And so I did choose to go to the BCUC. So I went to Vancouver, uh, first of all, and we each had five minutes to speak. It felt, when we were there, like a very empowering democratic experience. And I was thrilled to have done my little part in participation. When I was there, I was there with Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and his wife Joan, who spoke on Indigenous rights and what's happening in the Treaty Aid in Northern Areas. But what I want to say about the BCUC, much as it felt like a really good opportunity to say our piece and really speak our truth, the parameters of what we were allowed to talk about were very limited. And as you probably know, the BCUC report was asked to only comment on economical matters. So that meant that those of us who went with very passionate views on Indigenous rights, Treaty 8, environmental impacts, climate change, and all of those things, well, some of us did cheat a little bit, and we brought some of those things into our comments. But they did not make the report because that was not the mandate of the report. So, um, I also attended the BCUC hearing in Victoria and there were hundreds of people. It was, it was an amazing thing to sit in that room with speaker after speaker after speaker going up to the mic with really, really informed comments. We felt like we were participating in something really good. But we know what happened after that. Let me ask you one question about that, yeah. because it's my understanding that, okay, you could not bring in the environmental issues, which are disastrous, by the way, for climate change and everything else, yeah. but even the economic issues and the business issues and the money issues, there was nothing in the BC UC report that would lead the Horgan government to change their trajectory of so many years, which was, we think this is a bad project, we're going to cancel it which well, was the promise made. Mm -hmm. basically. Well, that's an interesting point because those of us that sat in on the hearings and heard how people were, were speaking up against Site C, when we first read the report, we were actually very pleased with what it had to say. We thought it was fair based on the limits that they had and that there were in the report options and considerations for environmental alternatives to energy that in the report stated would have been cheaper than continuing with Site C. So it was there that there could have been an alternative. And so when the, um, when the lobbyists started to enter afterwards and presented you know, a different economic vision, I think maybe minds got changed or influenced or whatever, and the BCUC report was probably not given as much credence as we hoped it would have been. I just noticed that in the media, it was presented as a 50-50 decision. But really, it wasn't 50-50. It was probably 95 stop and 5% continue. The public, I think, was given a, the impression that really this is a tough decision to make. But based on everything, it wasn't a tough decision to make. I think you're right that it probably was by most media presented as 50-50. So uh, my main comment on that was, that's fine even if that were true, had they really wanted to stop it for other reasons, there were enough reasons in there. But what it does for me is it highlights the fact 
once again that we weren't allowed to talk about Indigenous rights, climate change and environmental impacts because let's face it, had those issues been in the report, there would have been no choice to make. It absolutely would have been a no. Um, I don't know if you feel you've covered how was the decision made? Or... Um, what I want to talk about a little bit with, with how the decision is made, there, there are many pieces that we, we don't know and will not be privy to. Obviously, uh, cabinet discussions are in camera and nobody can talk about those. But what I do want to mention here is since the decision was made, all the information we're getting about um, the relationship to China. And I have found this very troubling because I think that one of the pieces that we need to find out more about, I think, is what the relationship to this decision was to um, the federal government. And the reason I say that is because I look at what's happening with trade right now. Trudeau's government is very, very concerned about NAFTA. And so what they're doing is they're refocusing on bringing back FIPA agreements and TPP agreements, which are trade and relationships with China and Asia. And so if you look at that, coupled with the fact that the Acon company has now been bought by a Chinese government corporation, I think that when we look at how the decision is made, perhaps the mistake some of us were, that were a bit more optimistic made was to think that this decision was being made by a BC NDP government. No, they're one player in a bigger power scheme, I think. This is what I've come to. I think if you're looking at uh, a Site C project that has relationship to other industry. We now know it's going to supply power to mining in the Yukon. You can see where the transition lines are and the relationship to the tar sands. That to just fight Site C as a, a unique and individual project maybe was the mistake we made. We, we needed to look at the international intrigue, the international trade. We needed to look at its relationship to industry as a whole. And I think those of us that have been involved in this for a long time perhaps um, made a little bit of a mistake in the most recent days of one, putting too much faith in BCUC and maybe ignoring how the pattern and intricate relationships with trade in Asia are, are playing out. And of course the failures of our own supposedly democratically elected governments to do what the people of the province and country yeah. want them to do. Yeah. Um, can you say something about the Indigenous rights issues? Yeah, no, I did mention that briefly when I talked about the fact we couldn't bring that in to the um, arguments at BCUC. But this is the issue that for me is one of the strongest because it's something I've been passionate about for many, many years. And the Site C project is going to be built on Treaty 8 land. Now it's important for people to understand that Treaty 8 is a historic treaty. It was signed in the 1800s. And what, what historic treaties do is they get rights over wide-ranging territories for hunting, fishing, and cultural practice. In, locally, we have the Douglas Treaty for the Sanish Nations, and they have similar rights. And so it's a little bit different than a modern treaty process because modern treaty processes actually limit rights to smaller regions of land and set them up so that they're more like municipalities. So a historic treaty, in my view, is something really, really significant to the province of British Columbia. And I think without question, it should have been considered, it should have been honored. The Treaty 8 nations that are here this weekend from West Moberly and Prophet River are about to launch a treaty infringement court case. And I can tell you that my heart and soul and even some of my finances are going to go in to support that because I, I think that uh, I am heartbroken that this government did not look at that piece with enough understanding, with enough historic reference. And, to infringe on a treaty that uh, is, is very important to our history. So as my understanding is the treaty says that people can live there as they had always lived there and 
the infringement is that Site C is going to destroy the area. So you can't yeah, the, in, much the, in, of the, area. the infringement is that it's going to flood a lot, a lot of the territorial land and uh, basically destroy their um, rights for hunting and fishing and cultural practice. So, yes, that's that's a big piece of this. Okay, so that's that's that thing. Which, which is going ahead. And there's a time frame into this summer, I guess, before it will be. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that it's probably um, also important to mention about the treaty infringement law case, which I could just mention briefly, is that the the um, the hope for that is that the courts will see that there's justice. But the fear is, these cases take months, even years, and I think the best we can hope for with this law case is that there will be some kind of monetary compensation. I don't see that the court case will actually have the ability to stop Site C. I think that may be a piece of if or how it's stopped, but it won't be able to stop it. My own feeling is that even if the stupid thing is built, it should never be filled. Right? Even if it can't be stopped until the very last day, it should never be filled, even mm -hmm. even then. Mm -hmm. um, so here we are at the Site C Summit in, in Victoria. What do you think, what would you like to see come out of this, or what is, what is the mission of this weekend? No, I think that's a really important question, and I've been thinking about it a lot, and I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to give a big answer, because I'm still personally navigating through a lot of the um, feelings and information about how this decision took place, what it means for all of us, and why we're here this weekend. But I can tell you this, that um, I have felt so incredibly disappointed with this decision, I can hardly put it into words, but coming here this weekend and hearing these amazing speakers that are really, really well informed, being amongst people that really want to have at least leave with a better understanding of why this decision was made, if nothing more, to have a deep understanding of how this came about. Um, I, I believe that some people are here with the hope that events like this can stop Site C. I'm not sure that I'm one of them, but I do feel that this has been incredibly unifying as a community. And perhaps, if I refer to the Indigenous Rights piece again, if we can really clarify in a deep-rooted way what mistakes we made about honouring Indigenous rights, particularly if we look at what was said during the election and what's being done now, maybe, just maybe, there's a way that we can come to an understanding of what the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People really means, not just, you know, the paper it's written on, what it really means, whether we agree to uh, understand the legal implications of the Declaration and apply it to other cases in the future, that would be at least something. And um, just to see the passion that's here this weekend and the understanding and the depth of knowledge that people have is maybe something that many of us needed to come together to express. Heather Tufts, thank you very much. Okay.